Welcome to Quilting's first reality show, live and unscripted, with Susan Smith. Hello and welcome. I'm Susan Smith and you are in my studio, Stitched by Susan. Today is a live and unscripted episode, which just means that I am airing the process of quilting a whole project without any stops and starts and without any edits. So you get to see everything in real time and you even get to see some of the oopses. And if you've watched these episodes before, you know there are indeed oopses from time to time. And I leave them in there because I feel like it's so beneficial to novice quilters and really to any quilter to see kind of what really goes on in somebody else's studio. And honestly, I don't know what your studio looks like or anyone else's other than my own. It's not easy to pick up my long arm and go work alongside a friend, right? So hopefully this glimpse into mine is helpful to you. And maybe some of you will pick up the baton and do some filming from your own studio so I can see what you do. Anyway. Uh, today, there were some oopses, honestly, before we even got on air, but I will talk about those stories in a minute. Let me briefly introduce what we're working on today. Uh, my husband's just bringing me a coffee, by the way. I forgot to pour one before the show. You know I've always got to sip my coffee while we're talking. So, today's project is a small whole cloth quilt, and I wonder if we could have a side camera for a moment, Mr. Producer. <laughs> Give us a second here. There we go. So you can kind of see the project and Stella's very much in the way and I, ah, I don't know how to get her out of the way. There we go. You can see it. By whole cloth quilt, I mean that there's no piecing involved. So this red piece of fabric is the whole quilt. And there's a pretty farm scene on the back. There was a picture of it in the thumbnail. And when the project is done, I'll post more photos on social media and I'll change the thumbnail too so you can see it a bit more. Um, the idea being having this solid fabric on the front enables me to see what I'm quilting and it gives me an opportunity to play with some quilting designs that I've been wanting to and it, it's low, um, what's the word, low commitment because it's a small quilt, right? So it's going to be border sampler style today so each sort of stripe is going to have a different border treatment in it so it's a great way to play with some new designs they're all you know just on one level you're not having to work in four directions so it's a great beginner project also it's a fantastic baby gift so low time investment because it's just one piece of fabric on the back and one piece of fabric on the top and the quilting is the thing and then of course you bind it and it's ready to go but here comes the first oops today so yesterday I had a crazy busy day. I was finishing a custom quilt in the morning and then I loaded a king sized quilt at noon onto my long arm using my Qmatic or um, digital system knowing that it had to be finished last night for today's show. And so while it was quilting between times between passes I was doing other things. One of the things I was doing was prepping for today. So I got out my two pieces of fabric and I, I tr always trim one a little bit smaller for the top right so that I've got some grippers on the side to the backing is a little bit larger to work with. So full width of fabric for the top, full width of fabric for the bottom, and I was going to trim that up a little bit. Well, don't you know I went and trimmed the farm portion, which is actually supposed to be the backing, and I didn't even realize it when I did it. And it was late last night, and I was laying them out on the floor and spritzing them a little bit with water to release some of the creases before I realized what I had done. So, you know, this show is all about reality and just making do and figuring it out. So what I did, I've got to set down my coffee to show you this a little bit, sorry. I haven't even had a sip. What I did was I put a leader on each side of that backing because it was now narrower. So I just sewed a scrap of fabric on each side to give me that extension so I could get the fullest width possible. I had already trimmed it down by three inches, so I did have to trim my red whole cloth down by about three and a half. And I just put some extra something onto the sides of that backing so that I have something to grip and something to hang on to, right? So my whole quilt's going to be about 40 or 41 wide, and I'm okay with that. Um, yeah, so that's how it's working. And it's kind of a poke at myself you'll see as we get quilting. I sewed back on the strip that I had cut off on the one side, which is kind of funny. And in case you're wondering, it wouldn't have worked to use that to add the width because I've got this farm seam, right? So when you sew a seam in there, then you get horses' heads cut off and barns that look funny and whatever. I did think about that briefly. Can I just sew it back on? But no, that didn't work. So it is what it is. 
So two weeks ago, I did a very similar show to this, and I had a, a tulip pink fabric on the back that time, and a kind of mottled, peachy, corally color on the top, and it was really difficult to see the stitching. Hard for you guys on the camera, even hard for me here quilting. And then partway through the show, my, my long arm machine, who's named Stella, by the way, started making some awkward noises, so I actually called a halt to the show because I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure about that noise. Turns out it was a super easy fix. It just needed some loose on the needle bar super easy but because of that I'm kind of doing the same thing again today but with this solid fabric that, so that you can see it however what I've done to save time today is I've already loaded it and I've already quilted my stripes into it so that it just saves a bunch of time so if you want to see that happening then just go back and watch that last whole cloth that was aired in early July and then you'll see the whole loading process in more depth. And today we'll focus on the quilting a little more. That brings us to story number two. Um, my husband, Dave, is Mr. Producer, is what we fondly call him. And he's always in the background doing all the things and making them all work. There he is waving at, waving at you. Um, and this morning, not that many minutes before we got on air, our close-up camera that shows the stitching close up, it's a GoPro because that deals well with the vibration. Um, its power source died. We were using this camera yesterday and it was working fine. And about 20 minutes before the show this morning, it died. So he spent about 10 narrowing down what the problem was and finally figured out there's like a case on it. The power goes in through that. That's what mounts it on the machine, etc. You don't want to know all those details, but short result is it crashed completely. So though my focus was intended to be on the stitching today, we're going to kind of regroup um, and I chose to do that instead of calling it off again. So we're going to have a camera from the side looking at kind of the big picture of me stitching. And from time to time, I'll get my roving camera in hand and show you the stitching. But unfortunately, we're not going to have that super close up look at the needle and the stitching. And I apologize for that, but that's kind of what happens in these live shows. So what's coming out of that as well is we are going to need to invest in another and different camera. This happened once before with this GoPro too. And so we're just gonna kind of pivot and change a little bit. So this brings me to YouTube is a free resource, which we are happy to provide for you. But if you do care to support the show, we've got this nifty fund and it's called buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by, Su stitched by Susan takes you to my page. And this fund we've kind of set up for these electronic things that we need to invest in. So I talked to you a couple weeks ago, we're getting some new lighting in place. Most of it is in the house. We're gonna be working on setting it up and our consultant friend is helping us do that as well. So that's coming around the corner, but now we've got this new camera. So that's gonna be more urgent for the moment. We've gotta get a new camera before the next episode and possibly even a backup system. So we don't have this, this crash and no sort of plan B. So if you're interested in supporting that, we welcome it. You can give as little as $5 one time, or you can, if you choose, set up for a monthly commitment, or you can buy any number of coffees, coffees one time. That is entirely up to you. But I just want you to know that every one of those dollars goes right into upgrading our equipment. And gosh, if you look back at our YouTube episodes from even two years ago, you'll see we've learned a lot. So um, what else should I mention? A few thanks that I need to give. Our son Will does the introductions all the time in the in the little interesting voices. Each episode has a, well, there's a few of them, but they circulate. The episodes are different. So thanks to Will for doing that. Of course, a big thanks to my husband, Dave, Mr. Producer. It's just a big, big job. And getting larger, frankly. <laughs> he gets a second hello. He's so thrilled. Um, but we're kind of thrilled. We feel like we feel like we're we've been kids playing at this for a long time, and we're sort of getting professional about it. Our lighting and our cameras and stuff, and it's it's rewarding and it's fun. He loves that stuff like crazy. So thanks to him, and thanks to our good friend Dan Unger who provides the guitar music that we play throughout the episodes. Okay, are we ready to get going? No, I have one more thing to tell you about. The twenty eighth of July is my birthday. That's next Friday. It's a week away, 29, right? and. Yeah, I'm turning 29 again and again and again. And some of my quilting students, I have an online course with lots of students that have been through it. And some of them are planning a surprise birthday party on air for me. I can't tell you a ton about it because it's a surprise. I know it's happening. I know that it's going to be interview style. I know that our daughter and my sister are going to be co-hosting. 
And that's about all I know. So it will be the same time as our regular Live and Unscripted next Friday, the 28th of July. And we'll call it the birthday show so that if you want to watch it later, you can. Um, yeah, who knows what else it holds? I have no idea. It'll be a surprise for me and a surprise for you. But you're welcome to join the party. Bring your own cake, though, I recommend. Okay, let's get quilting. We need to get things on the road here. Okay, I did mention on air that I was going to let everyone have a, have a vote, a say in what color thread that I quilted with. Well, I decided to go ahead and get this quilt, kind of give it a jump start. So you don't get to do that after all, but I'll talk to you about it just a little bit. Uh, maybe if I get on the other side, it'll be better. So I had thought of two things. One is the red thread, which clearly coordinates with the red fabric but shows up quite a bit, not necessarily in a good way on this farmy, greeny, olivey kind of scenery. And so I did opt instead to go with the olive green thread that you're seeing here. It's actually called wasabi, that thread color. It's really pretty, um, kind of a, a golden olive green a little bit. It matches the foliage and the grass and everything on this the farm background very nicely, and it looks pretty on the red as well. And in my experience, because I've done a few of these quilts and given them away, the recipients don't usually realize that the whole cloth is the plain part and that's really the front and the back is the print and so they often treat the print as the front which is fine it's their quilt they can do whatever they like but I thought I want then for the stitching to look pretty on that printed side so I opted to go with the green so that's what we're doing okay so basically as I said I've already pre-quilted in some stripes and all I did for those was set my a channel lock which in my case is locking and gauging one of my belts so that I can make beautiful horizontal lines I don't know what options your machine has but that's super easy for me so for each division of stripe I did a parallel pair of lines and they're about three sixteenths of an inch apart I think that double line as a division is a prettier look than the single line so when I do some of the close-up shots you'll see that and you can decide for yourself you certainly could get away with a single line but if you have quilting close up on both sides of that it just doesn't make as good a division as a double one in my opinion so I chose to go with double so now I'm just going to start at the top end of the quilt and work my way down quilting different things in these different borders what shall we start with I'm, I was going to say ribbon candy, but you know, I'm quilting kind of at arm's length, so I think I'm going to do something easier. I think we're just going to do L and E loops. This is a great way, by the way, to practice your quilting skills. A fabulous way. Any design you've been wanting to work on, this is just a great opportunity to practice it. So I've got my stitch length set at 10. I do have my stitch regulator on. I'm going to be quilting all different things, not the same thing repetitively. So it's a good time to use the stitch regulator if you have one. Just keeps everything uniform. Um, I have the olive green thread, which I mentioned. It is Isocord 100% poly thread in a 40 weight. And I am stitching on my Bernina Q24. Her name is Stella. I know I've said that once already, but. And I've been giving Stella lots of positive affirmation. Yesterday, that huge king size quilt that was all on the Cumatic system, she just powered through that like a champ. Earlier this week, I had a quilt loaded that had um, quite a lot of machine applique on it. And in some cases, there were two, three, four, I think in one place I even counted five layers of fused fabric and Stella quilted through that like a champ. It's been a good week. I was away last weekend and I came home to four quilts that had arrived in the mail. And I'm happy to say that by this afternoon, I will have four quilts back in the mail. Not the same four, mind you, but just keeping that turnaround ticking over. There's one border. Now I'm gonna make a funny decision here. My next one I've got, uh, it's quite wide, it's about four inches, and I know what I want to do in it. 
I'm going to space some kind of crazy eights across it. And I know that spatially I do better working from left to right because that's the way we read and it still is easier that way. So I'm just going to skip down and do the next border from right to left so that I don't have to break thread, but I can do this one, my favorite choice, which is going to be left to right. So we're just going to do something really casual on this slim little one. I'm just going to do a scallopy wavy line. I kind of prefer to not make every border fussy fancy. The eye has a little bit of place to rest, if you will. It's just less distracting if you have a few simple ones mixed in with the more elaborate ones. This next one that I'm going to do is one of my favorites of all time. So first off, I'm gonna do some um, wishbones or eights from top to bottom of that border. Like I said, the border's about four inches high. Uh, my spacing from loop to loop is probably an inch and a quarter, perhaps an inch and a half. Yeah, I would say an inch and a half. And I'm trying to almost, but not quite, touch my stripe divider lines. I really don't want to stitch over them. That really catches your eye. I'd rather fall a stitch or two short than go a, a thread or two over. And there I went over while I was talking about it. Look at that. If you can see the quilt behind me, you can see one of the reasons why I love these. I call them crazy eights when I do it as an all over design on a quilt because the rows kind of interlink and overlap and I love that texture. But we're gonna do a little bit treatment today, a little bit different treatment today. This is my favorite part. I'm gonna go back across putting pint sized eights between. And this is one of my favorite designs on these stripy sort of quilts. I honestly don't use this much as a border just because it's difficult to turn a corner with it. But you could certainly do a border when you do, you know, two, the way that you would attach borders when you're sewing, when you do two of them all the way across and then the other two all the way across in the other direction and you don't try and miter the corner, it would work in that application. I just love the effect of this layering of the little eights. Super cute. And I'm going slowly because I'm trying to match my angles of the, the wishbone um, arms, if you will, as best I can. It is definitely not perfect. But slow and control, that's my goal. There we go, that one's done. Now what? Now we'll do our ribbon candy. This one seems about the right size for that. Again, I'm endeavoring to very nearly touch, but not go over my dividers. It's hard to make them perfect, but in my opinion, it looks better if you fall a little short than if you overshoot. Who else loves ribbon candy? I'll do the next one after this, and then we'll take a brief pause, and you can ask any questions that you've got about maybe the setup, or how I planned the spacing, whatever questions you like about this project, and I will do my best to answer them. And I didn't mention, it's really helpful to Mr. Producer if you put a capital Q in front of your question. Lots and lots of comments, hundreds of comments come in. So he can then actually search for the letter Q and all the questions will pop up. And we try really hard to answer them all. I take brief breaks to do that. I try really hard to answer them all. That's all I'll say about that. If I miss yours, I'm so sorry. 
we do try. And I just need to get my yardstick on the end holding up my side clamp over here. You guys can see that a little bit. It just bumped a touch at the end. Not so bad that I have to undo it though. This time I'm just doing some alternating direction C's, I guess we'll call them, with a little droplet on the end. One of my sources for ideas for borders like this, I mean, besides social media and other quilters, which can be grand, but it can be hard to find a topic, if you will. But Pinterest is a really great place to look for ideas. So if you search for something like quilted borders or quilted small borders or quilted large borders, you'll get a ton of ideas. And I don't know if you use Pinterest very much, but whenever you've got some ideas on the screen, if you look down near the bottom, there's an option for doing more like this. And then you can get lots of it will just populate with similar things. If you find some that you like or a style that you like, opt for more like this and you'll get more similar ideas. Okay, Mr. Producer, sir, have we got some questions? So he's just looking, hooking up a side camera. We're gonna do a little roving camera. Why don't I detach Stella? Is that going to take a moment? Okay, Mr. Producer is telling me that job is going to take a minute to get that roving camera ready. So why don't I go ahead and quilt some more? He can't um, load the questions onto the screen while he's doing that, right? One thing at a time. So I'll go ahead and keep quilting. This one that I'm going to do next, I promised you one that had tire tracks on it. So it kind of carries on that farming theme a little bit. Someone on the last episode, um, the Tulip Pink fabric had tigers on it. And she said, are you doing paws or something that would carry on that theme? And I wasn't, but I thought today, aha, I'm gonna put some, some tire tread in there. So here we go. And of course, I'm not exactly quilting tire tread. I'm just doing something that I think suggests it. So it's a little bit like quilting a spineless feather. I did not mark a center line down my stripe. I could have and perhaps even should have to give myself a guideline. You certainly could just chalk or um, erasable marker a line down the center of this stripe. I'm just eyeballing it. I think it'll be okay. And basically these are arranged and, and relate to each other like feather fronds would, but in this case, they're pointed. because so I thought that looked much more like tractor tread. The little lights you're seeing underneath, by the way, are my stitch regulator. So there's two cameras mounted um, on the foot plate. And that's what you're seeing, those two little red lights with the cameras. And they're reading the fabric as it passes over them and maintaining a nice smooth 10 stitches per inch for me. What do you think of my tire tread? It certainly does not look exactly like a tractor. I feel like if I sat and fiddled around with it for a little bit though, you could probably figure out, you know, maybe not this exact mirror image that I'm quilting, but maybe 
two or three that kind of interlock on one side and then two or three on the other side. So one should go find some tractors and have a look at their tread and see if you could get some variations on this that might be fun. Whether or not it looks realistic is not the point, but it just might give some fun variations. And as I come to the end, I'm just going to attempt to make it look like I was quilting right off the edge, like this. As though that pattern just extended right off the end. I think that looks pretty decently like tracks left in dust behind the tractor, honestly. Do you know what, Mr. Producer? I can take this camera mount right off, can't I? There, and you guys have just a touch better visibility. Okay. We are going to bring on a roving camera. Is that what we're doing? Okay. All right, you guys, let's give this a try. So I've got a camera in my hand now, which you can see. Mr. Producer is going to change um, what you're viewing on the screen and I'll try and move nice and slowly so that you can, oh, there we go. Can you see the tire tread? I feel like that looks like a tractor that's been, you know, going through the sandy farm field. And I'll get straight on so you can see the different borders. And you can see the little double eights. I love those. I really, really do. So that's what we've got so far. So we're just gonna continue on putting different things in all the different stripes. You can see here where I've done the the little double lines. And you know, do you agree that double line just sets them apart a little bit? You know, imagine if my ribbon candy was next to a single line and then the C's below it bumped against that single line. There's just not enough separation. So I feel like the double line is helpful. Yeah, so there it is. All right. Let's see if I can get this camera back in the stand. Okay, Whew. got it. I'm gonna get my coffee cup in hand. We're gonna take some questions. All right, Gwenna, just jumping on, what type fabric do you use for whole cloth? Gwenna, I just have very simple um, cotton quilting fabric. I think the red is a Kona cotton. The farm scene is from Henry Glass um, and it's super cute, it's got uh, maybe when we get to the end, I'll be able to hold it up. It's got cows and red barns and grassy fields. It's very pretty. Okay, more questions. More sips of coffee. Susie, how often do you go live? Susie, I try and go live twice a month. I used to do first and third Friday of each month and that was so easy for you all to follow, I know. But I'm doing more traveling and different things right now and Mr. Producer has a full-time job too. So we just try and do it twice a month, but it's always Friday and it's always the same time of day. And I try to send out in my newsletter a couple days beforehand, which day it will be and what the project is. So about twice a month, hope that helps. Susan Swindle, has your mother who taught you to quilt been able to see you at work with Lucy or Stella? Would love to know her reaction. Sadly, no. My mother passed away 27 years ago. Yes, I was still in my 20s with very young babies. And, you know, I did grow up making quilts alongside my mom in the, in the very traditional um, sewing in a sewing machine, uh, hand quilting type of way. So she certainly saw me doing those. We did them together. Um, but she never, I don't know that she had ever heard of a long arm. I doubt it. 27 years ago in our neck of the woods, they were unheard of. So yeah, sorry, no. However, I do, my dad married again and I, more than 20 years ago. So I have a stepmom who does follow very faithfully and is probably watching as we speak. If so, hi, Judy. <laughs> She's a big encourager. So there's that. Yeah. Lots of questions. Susie, what do you use to keep your bobbin? with the cone when storing. Um, if you don't mind if I go off camera, oh look, I've got one right here. I was gonna say I'll go off camera, but I've got it right here. Check this out. My son actually, this was his idea. So this is like a food, you know, that you would put through a burger type of pick and it's a little wider at the top. Can you see that? And I just drop that through the bobbin on top of my cone. And my thread storage, 
some weeks back, I think in April, I was doing a little live every day and one day I showed my thread storage system. It's a rack that I got at a quilt shop, but it's deep and it allows me to store three cones in each sort of slot. And it's just the right height for these, but this whole bobbin and, and peg apparatus will not fit like under the layers before. So this is always my front cone and I can put multiple bobbins on it if so be I have a couple wound. And it works perfectly on that front cone. You all need a rack just like mine, but I can't tell you where to get one. <laughs> okay. Okay, here's a question. Mr. Producer was just coaching me. Savannah, so many sporadic thunderstorms here that I haven't had my long arm turned on in almost two weeks, okay? And so Mr. Producer is saying, because this is his field, use a UPS, which is an uninterrupted power supply. He's putting a link in the comments for you. Honestly, I think that this is important for every long arm quilter, because even though I live in an area that does not typically have power outages, they do happen from time to time. And so you're, you've got an expensive machine, protect it with a $100 power system, which usually will give you, they vary, but say 15 minutes to shut the things down, right? And exit out of your programs if indeed you're on a computer, but at least to power down your machine. So invest in that, link in the comments. Dorothy, how can one order these huge isocord cones? How many meters are they? They are 5,000. I can't remember if they're meters or yards off the top of my head. And I'll tell you where I started and then I'll tell you where I get them now. I started on eBay and I found a seller who offered them at a good price and he carried every color. They have over 300 colors and there was no minimum number and no shipping. And at the time they were like 1150 a cone. I don't know what they are now, but they were better than store price. So that's where I began. When I got busier and was using more cones, I contacted Amon USA, who's the producer of it. It's, I think it's A-M-M-A-N. You can Google it and you can find it, the producer of Isocord Thread. And I got a wholesale account. And so then I did have a minimum purchase, but if I was ordering enough, I could get a really good price on those cones. So that those are both options for you. Linda. Hello from South Carolina. I managed to work out the tension issue on my machine and is now quilting my first quilt. It's an older machine. Awesome. I'm glad you're finding success with that. You will never regret spending time getting to know your machine. It will pay off down the road. It's frustrating in the moment, but it always pays off down the road. Okay, here's some questions apparently about Stella. Carolyn, are your metal clamps on the front bar, belly bar? Oh, you're asking if my metal clamps are on the front and they're not Carolyn because, and Brenda's asking too, and apparently someone else, there was three you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not seeing them. That's because I've already worked my way all the way down the quilt, basting the sides and laying in those horizontal lines. So my entire quilt is already stabilized. So I don't have to put that on. Um, quilt is attached to backing and it's all attached to that roller at the bottom. So you'll see as I get to the bottom too, but you'll see it as we go. Savannah, she sure missing that close up camera today. All I see is red at the moment. I know, I'm sorry you're seeing red. I'm sorry. What can I say? Dorothy, is it possible to have a light shining on where you are quilting? Um, shall we try it with the light? Okay, so so here's the thing, Dorothy. In general, when we have the close-up camera on, it looks better if I have my headlamp off. I get so much glare with that headlamp, but because today is different, I'll try it with the headlamp on and we'll see if that does make it clearer. Absolutely, we'll give it a try. Michelle, I'm starting to have lower back problems when long arming. Do you recommend any specific stretches when you're working for several hours? Love your videos. Michelle, I'm pretty fond of yoga type stretches. They are a huge relief. Everything feels better when I stretch neck, stretch shoulders, stretch hips, and so forth at the end of a day and at the beginning of a day. So I, personally, because I'm not really a workout buff, I have pretty short ones. They're like 10 to 12, maybe 20 minutes but yoga stretches really help. Pilates probably would too, but it's not the high impact. It's literally the stretching of your joints and muscles that really helps to relieve some of that pain. Yeah. Judy, how do you decide what width to use for your row of stitching? Can't see what you were stitching. So I assume you mean the stripes, Judy. 
Number one, I have a quilt laying on the floor actually beside me that I've done before that was just feeding me kind of ideas. Um, but number two, they're just random. I think my biggest one is going to come up in a few minutes and it's about six inches and you'll see why I'm doing kind of a bottom and top design in that. I have some that are four and my smallest one is probably an inch. I just laid them in randomly. I did not really pre-plan what I was going to put where. I just had some idea of the types of borders I wanted to quilt and therefore whether I needed wide ones or, and I just tried to mix them up. They're random though. So an inch to six inches ish. Kathleen, how do you attach your red solo cups to the machine? Brilliant idea. I don't have a great solution, Kathleen, at the moment. Uh, we, can we get Stella in the shot? I don't know that you'll be able to see it. Not really. I just have a magnetic bar, like on a double stick tape, stuck to my machine. And I have two solo cups and I have a magnet stuck to my inner cup. Right? So this bottom cup just sticks right on there. So it's not super sturdy, but it's enough to hold it in place. And then I can carry this one away and dump it when I need to and just plop it back in there. So it isn't fancy, but it does work. Mary Ellen, the close-up is great, but I'm hoping you show these designs again when your camera works as watching the motion is helpful. You know, I definitely will, Mary Ellen. I think this is whole cloth quilt number four, and they're always popular, so I'm going to keep on doing them. Um, I don't know if you're in my advanced membership. I do have a monthly subscription membership, and I do have one specific whole cloth in there that hasn't been released on YouTube where I did you know, go in much more depth and instructional in terms of what those different borders and designs are. So um, in the description, it won't be in there yet, but when this uh, uploads to YouTube, YouTube, in the description, there will be a link to more information about that membership if you wanted it. Forgiven to press on. Woohoo! Looking at your tread, Susan, can hear the putt, putt, putt of an Alice Chalmers. I know what an Alice Chalmers 45 is. So yes, good, good, good. Nailed it then, right? Erin, what are the size differences from a baby to a lap quilt? Oh gosh, Erin, I don't know that there's a hard and fast answer, but to me, a lap quilt is anything that's big enough to like throw over your knees at the very least, but really big enough to cover you sort of from shoulders to feet to nap under. That's my interpretation. And a baby quilt is usually smaller. When I make a baby quilt, it's usually one with the fabric so that I don't have to piece my backing. So it's less than 45 wide and something proportional long, like maybe 52 or 55 long-ish. Judy, do you use the channel lock to do the double lines that separate the border work? Yes, I do. So on my machine, it's not called a channel lock anymore because I have the um, robotic system, right? And I have belts. So I engage the belt to keep that straight, um, perfectly straight line, but whatever works on your machine. And yes, I did use those, they're super helpful. Is that about it for questions? Oh gosh, there's still more. Terry, when you first started learning free motion, did you mark your quilt? What and how did you do it? Oh, funny story, Terry. I don't have the quilt handy. I'll have to do a trunk show one of these days. The very first quilt that I free motion quilted was on my domestic machine. And it had a kind of a, just a, you know, meandering feather border around the outside. And I had found a picture of this feather border that had a few kind of whimsical styles of feathers, like a leaf put in there and a, and a puff head kind of in there. And I had found this picture that I loved, so I blew it up on my photocopier, and I did. I traced every single line all the way around the border of that quilt, and that's what I quilted at my domestic machine. So yes, when I first did it, I traced out everything. I think I only did it on that one quilt before I realized that actually if you had the spine drawn in, it was fairly easy to just freestyle it as you went. And so I've done that ever since for feathers. Um, for some of these things, I don't know that any of these are things I would trace. They're all freehand. With the crazy eights though, I might have dropped in spacing for them. So you could either mark that on your quilt, or if you're gonna do a couple of those, you could mark it on a piece of blue painter's tape. I've done this on whole quilts, like the one behind me when I wanna establish my spacing. I've put markings on the blue tape because then you can move it down the quilt, right? So that would work for here too, if you wanted to but I don't in detail mark anymore for my free motion. So another Susan, how do you attach your scissors to the machine? Um, do we, we don't have a camera on the other side today, do we? I can show you here though. Let me move Stella over. Can you see this clip that's in my hand? So on my machine, I've got these clips that allow me to change my handlebars all about. And those clips happen to have, I'm trying to get to where you can see it. This clamp, side view might work. 
Yeah, there you can see it. There's a little groove in it. So I just, I can move that clamp around in terms of where I want to latch it. And I just latched it in such a way that it was at the right angle to hold my scissors. And I, of course, do it on my right side because I'm right-handed. And my scissors just stick in that little groove. I also have a magnet on the top of my machine, which I have used in the past, but these very fine snips fit right there. And you know, it's four inches closer, saves time. I've learned something today. It's, it's best not to wear things that have straps. <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep fiddling, I'll try not to. <laughs> Desiree, how did you do the tracks? I can't see where you continued. Um, I'll do a close-up shot of them again, Desiree. How's that? In a little bit, we'll come and do another roving camera, and I'll give you a nice close-up of them so you can see them. Okay, we've got a question about Lucy. Lucy was my last long arm, by the way. Oh, Stella. Stella. Stella's the current long arm. I always name my machines. I can't help it. Sue, how are you able to figure out the needle bar needed some oil? I have a Q24 also and only know about oiling the hook. So I was speaking to a technician about it, um, is the short answer. Apparently there's part two. Let me see part two, Mr. Producer, sir. Also, could you show us where and how you oiled the needle bar? Sadly, I can't. So I was, I was with a technician on the phone and it's something that typically your technician would do during a servicing. Um, he was gracious and talked me through it, but you actually have to pull off the, um, the wheel to be able to see inside. And it wasn't oil, it was lube, which is thicker. And I think that matters. I don't think you wanna be just dropping oil in there. So definitely talk to your technician before you attempt it and get some advice from him and some guidance, I would say. It was easy to do, but he walked me through the process um, step by step. Carla, you are so organized. How do you keep all these ideas stored in your brain? How do you keep all these? I thought that's what I said, Mr. Producer. He's correcting me, I don't know. Anyways. How do I? Well, for one thing, Carla, it's massive repetition, right? I've done these same processes many, many times. And I am not a collector of um, kitschy things in my living room or china. I'm a collector of quilting tips. So I, I don't know, I just, I love quilting tips and I store them up and I share them. I, I just love them, so. And love the measuring tape you have across your bar. Can you tell me where you get that? Yes, ag again, and um, when this, posts to YouTube when we're finished, a whole automatic description goes up below this episode. And there's a link there. I think Mr. Producer is going to try and put it um, in the comments as well. But if you do use my links in the descriptions, by the way, little disclaimer, they are Amazon links and I do get a tiny commission on them and it's no additional cost to you. So using those links is really is helpful for me, but it's called the Long Armors Measuring Tape. And I used um, just simple 3M double-sided sticky tape to put it on. And I just did it a piece at a time and worked my way out to the edges. That's how I attached it. So, yep. I mean, I think any of those brands, you probably can't see it, sorry. Mr. Producer's got a whole bunch going on the screen in front of me. Any brand works, you just want a long one. And I just made it fit across my bar and trimmed the ends, so. Okay, let's get quilting, you guys. I do need to advance my quilt a little bit, so I will do that. Taking all my side apparatus off. Oh, I'm gonna move Stella to the side. Okay. I think that's got enough room. I've got a little dusty rim on here. I'm not sure what I did there but I think it is just dust, so it will wash off. Okay, for our side clamps, this is a great day for an example of these. Let me do the one closest to you. Have we got the side cam on, Dave? Let me do the one closest to you so that you can see it. On this edge of backing fabric, it's often a selvage, and on this one, I'm sure you can't see it on the camera, but it's got that little eighth inch fringe that selvages often have. And of course, on my side clamps, I've done a little tiny YouTube episode on these, which shows closely the little channel that you're trying to put that into is so slim and it can be really, really hard to get that edge into that slim channel. Corsage pin to the rescue. 
run that pin along, sometimes picking up the fabric with the point of the pin and coaxing it in. And just that little coaxy bit helps. Tug a little bit. There we go. It's in. Little bit fiddly, but not too bad. Still totally worth it for the beauty of this long clamp. And I'm going to do the same thing on this side. I have a selvage on my strip that I added too. A little bit furry along the edge. There we are. So again, I do not have side clamps on. Um, sorry, I do not have the front magnets on um, because it's all basted in place. And I kind of see what's happening. Somewhere this picked up lint. And I wonder if my roller had lint on it. I don't know about that. But lint I know will come off. So I'm not too terribly worried. Okay, what should we quilt in the next line? I'm thinking it's a little line, so I'm thinking maybe some kind of double O's. Not exactly Cheerios, but kind of. So once again, I am stitching on a Bernina Q24. Her name is Stella. I am using the stitch regulator. And I currently have BSR2 on, which means it sits absolutely still until I move the machine. So we're quilting on this little whole cloth, kind of a sampler of border type designs. This is such a great project, honestly, for beginners because you're quilting a border type design and yet you're only quilting in one direction. You're not having to do it in all four directions as you would have to on a real quilt. So it's a great way to kind of work out the thread path of some of these designs. Okay, let us pause for a second and turn on that light so that you guys can see the headlight um, and see if that helps you. There's the headlight. How does that look? I'll quilt for a few minutes and you can um, take a moment to give your feedback on what you think about it. It takes a few minutes for the, all those comments to come through and for us to see them. So I'll check back at the end of this row and we'll decide whether we're going to leave it on or go back to headlight off. Pausing again, I've got thread tails hanging over the quilt here. Thread tails reminds me, one of my to-dos yesterday was a cleanup of my studio. I try, I do like being surrounded by order, so I try and put things away as I work, but inevitably when I'm working on multiple quilts and then I'm mailing out boxes and then I'm measuring the next quilts and all these things. Inevitably, I get this sort of backlog of stuff. So I just took the time to put things away and to thoroughly vacuum in all the nooks and crannies. So this time I'm quilting, um, I'm not doing diamonds or triangles because straight or slanted lines, perfectly straight, are hard to do but I'm kind of doing this gothic arch sort of shape a little bit. So a little curved, but pointed. And I'm gonna echo this back in the other direction and they're gonna cross over each other. And again, this is a place where you might want to establish some spacing markings. I am just freestyling it, but that's up to you. I gotta make sure I get myself placed for the other ones. So I'm going the same, the same top to bottom orientation, but um, what's the word I want? It escapes me, I'm sorry. But anyway, I'm overlapping them by 50%. I can't always think of my words and quilt at the same time. So this is, you know, pretty simple but really effective. 
I think the double looks far better than the single would on its own. For one thing, it camouflages any imperfections of spacing quite nicely. Okay, this next one I am going to do a little bit of marking, so let me just grab my chalk. This is a clover, I think it's a Chaco liner, and it's got a little wheel and a little chalk reservoir. And I am going to quilt L, like cursive L-shaped loops, but I'm going to make a scalloping kind of spine in the middle, and then my loops are going to follow, the height of my loops are gonna follow that spine. And in general, can I see what I'm seeing, Dave, for a minute? Okay, by the way, be giving us some feedback on the, um, the light, whether you're liking the headlight on or off before I start quilting again. Sorry? Everyone likes the headlight on. Okay, we'll leave that on. So this is the largest spacing that I did and it's about six inches. My scallopy line that I'm going to draw through the middle, I'm going from about a third from the bottom and a third from the top. I'm keeping that kind of in my mind, that central third. And now I'm just going to scallop back and forth between. Okay, I'll try, I'll try. I think we're, I think we're chopping it up too much. Sorry, I'm just conversing with Mr. Producer here. No, I think we'll show it after. So we're, we're just talking about whether or not we should do the roving camera while I'm doing this, but it just, it takes more time and it's more unwieldy for sure. So I'm just drawing this uh, fairly loose, fairly broadly spaced scallop, approximately in that center third. And I'm using white chalk. I do not recommend colored chalk, by the way, for quilting markings, because you never know if that colored bit has something else in it other than just chalk. So I'm very much a white chalk believer. Whether it's school chalk or a chalk pen or that little roller, any way works. And now this one, it doesn't really matter to me whether I go left or right. So I'm going to do one row of L's this way and one row of L's this way. And they're going to more or less meet in the middle. Never was quilting more like handwriting than in this design, was it? I don't know how many of you sat in handwriting practice class. Making L's. And here we are again. While I continue stitching that, for those of you who are just joining, a quick rundown. I'm stitching on my Bernina Q24. I'm using Isocord 100% polyester thread in a kind of avocado green color. And we're working on a whole cloth project. So there's no piecing. We've just got this solid piece of red fabric for the front and a sweet little farming panoramic scene as the backing which I'll show you more when I get to the end. I'll probably dismount the quilt so I can show you that. And we're just quilting a variety of border designs arranged basically in stripes from side to side of the quilt. So it is a superb way to practice some quilting designs you've been wanting to try because you don't have to turn corners or worry even about stitching in different directions. So it's really non-threatening. Okay, now we're gonna quilt our loops the other way. I do not worry about placing them, spacing them similarly to their mirror image because when I do the tiny loops, they end up closer together. And when I do the bigger loops, they end up further apart. And of course, I'm alternating big loops below tiny loops. Does that make sense? 
So I choose to just not pay attention to what the spacing of the loops is on the row above. And again, I'm trying to get close to, but not quite touch my horizontal dividing lines. I really don't want to stitch over them with my design that's between them. This could be, I don't know, a very frisky kitten running in loop-de-loops. I'm not sure what else this could represent on the farm. Maybe a gambling calf. I did say this was a great opportunity to practice different designs, and that's true. It's also a great opportunity to practice your consistency of speed. Sometimes the stitch regulator can be used as a tool to help you with that. So even though the stitch regulator is regulating your stitches, also you can hear the sound of the motor. So use that as a tool. Oh, and we just, I think, ran out of bobbin thread, as I think what happened there. What an inopportune place to do it. But as I was saying, use that sound of the motor to really focus on trying to make your stitching speed smooth and even and not be surging too drastically over these loops. Seriously, this was an inopportune moment because there are no bits that really cross over or are in a seam allowance or have a point, any of the things I would usually look for to splice thread. So what I'm doing right at the moment is I'm undoing a few inches. I do typically just let my bobbin run out and then I change it. That's just my personal method of, I don't like fiddling with having to determine how many you know feet are left and wasting a few yards at the end, etc. So I just let it run out. But that last six inches or so of thread does not have good tension on it then. So I always undo a little bit and I look for appropriate places uh, to make that join as unobtrusive as possible. And in this case, the only place I've got is where these loops are crossing over each other. That's the best choice, I think. So I'm stopping about a quarter inch from one of those crosses. And then I'm going to start my stitching back about a quarter inch. And overlap the stitches and see how it looks. Because my other choice is to undo that whole row. That does not feel like a good choice to me. I don't know what you think, but that does not feel like a good choice to me. So I've got another bobbin wound. <coughs> Excuse me. Which is lovely. I have an onboard bobbin winder, so I can always have that extra bobbin winding. And I, I choose in most of my threads to have two spools just so that I can wind my bobbins sort of as I go. I'm just going to get a sip of coffee. My throat is very scratchy. Excuse me for that. I'll try not to slurp into the microphone. All right. So again, I'm, I know you can't see this very well, but I'm just going back to where there's a cross of stitching. And my first needle down, I didn't exactly get on the stitching line, so I'm just doing it again. Pulling up my bobbin thread. And I'm going to lock stitch. And I'm going to do it in single stitches so that I can absolutely control it because I want to line up right on that stitching line and I'm moving just a teeny, teeny, tiny touch with each stitch. So I'm going to have about seven or eight stitches that overlap. And of course, on the bottom one that I cut, they're not short. It was just stitching along at 10 per inch. But on this top one now, I've made them tiny and short and they've anchored that bottom one because I'm stitching right over it. And I think that actually looks pretty darn good. So now I will try and smoothly start stitching again with luck. Yeah, I think we're in good shape here. And just continue on.
Now, some of you may wonder, I did not stop and run my bobbin through my toe gauge to check for tension, but one of the ways that I like to check, can you see how I'm just reaching under the quilt and I'm running my nail sharply, like firmly along the stitching underneath. If I have any laddering going on underneath or that bottom thread is pulling too tight, I will feel that my nail will bump, bump, bump over the stitches, right? And I can see, of course, on the top that it's not pulling too tight on the top. So that's a pretty good judge of my tension being okay. All right, what are we gonna quilt on the next one, folks? Uh, we don't wanna do loops again, because we've just done loops. Let me just look at my sample quilt laying on the floor here for a second, see if I have another good idea for something to quilt. I say, let's quilt some little hearts in this one. So, um, I think I'm gonna go back to the other side again and do this one left to right. I still, as much as I try to practice quilting in every direction, it still is easier from left to right. When I'm doing a design I haven't been quilting very often or one that's a little bit precise like this one I'm going to try next. Um, I wanna get it accurate. So that's totally a matter of preference. So this is kind of a ribbon candy variation ish, but it's going to look more like hearts. You'll see what I mean in a second. So basically I'm doing two bumps on the top and bottom, but still letting the sides touch exactly like I would in ribbon candy. Oh, here comes Mr. Producer with his roving camera. Seriously, you guys, I mean, I don't mean to hint, but you owe him a coffee, just saying. Designs like this are so good for practicing your, almost your peripheral vision, but certainly how you visualize space and how to put one thing next to another. I would practice it on paper first and kind of figure out how far you've got to swing to form those hearts to try and keep them symmetrical. Aren't they cute? As always, I'm trying to get very close to, but not stitch over my dividing lines. And in some cases, there's a little bit of space where I'm not quite touching them. I think it looks better to be a couple threads of fabric away from than to stitch over. So I'm doing that on purpose, just falling a little short of those dividing lines. And for those of you maybe just joining in, I did my prep work by stitching all those dividing lines in place before the show actually began, and they're just random. There was no particular method to that madness. I'm gonna do another one that's a two-pass design. This is kind of like the letter M in handwriting class. This might have been easier on a little slimmer line, but here we are. And again, if you wanted to, you certainly could take the time to mark out spacing for these. They might be more precise than mine if you did that. But I'm choosing to just eyeball it. You'll see when I go to put the second half of this quilting design in, much like the gothic arches that we did above, it all seems to just look okay when it's all said and done. 
Okay, this time I'm doing the opposite of the arches. So in the arches, I went with the same orientation top to bottom on my way back. This time I'm going to do the opposite orientation. So now my humps are downwards where I was quilting them upwards before. And now I get this little almost tulip look. So now our farm has tulip fields too. Because we have a pretty farm. And you can see, even with the imperfections, totally looks great. I know I've said it already half a dozen times, but I'm going to say it again. This is such a great way to practice your control of your machine exactly where you want to place the needle, exactly where you want your stitching to stop. And I will say too, my eye is never following the needle. My eye is always at where I'm going to go next, always. It's like when you're driving, you do not ever watch the front hood of your vehicle you watch way out on the highway in front of you where you're going. It enables you to be smoother. This is much the same way. Okay, we're going to stop needle down and do an advance and take some questions. If you are enjoying this, please, please hit the like, thumbs up, and subscribe to the channel so that you are notified whenever I go live. I think you have to hit the bell for that one too to get the notifications. Um, but if you're enjoying this kind of freestyling, candid method of quilting, this is what I do a lot of. And it is my pleasure to show you behind the scenes, to show you like I did today, even some of my oopses, um, when I cut the wrong fabric, more narrow, um, these things happen and you get to see the ways that I deal with that. And what you're seeing me do now is as I advanced, I'm actually putting my clips, my side clamps onto the edges of my leader so that this is now going, it can't slide back. So even when I unload and dismount my quilt, um, this is held into place, ready to load the next quilt. It just saves me having to pick it up and pull it into place the next time. Is all, just a little time saver there. Let me get my side clamps on and we will take some questions. Got something else on the screen, Dave. Susie, go Dave, go. Love the camera action. Yes, we do appreciate it ever so much. I'll give Dave a coffee for all of you. How's that? I'll fix him a nice one after the show is over. Maybe it'll be an iced tea, actually. So again, I'm using my corsage pin to just coax that little uh, furry, so fringy selvage edge into the channel of my clip. These two are in the description of my recent YouTube channels. They're by Red Snapper and they're called E Edges, I have learned. And I do love them because they are long and put tension on the whole thing as opposed to a clip and a clip. That's what I love about them. So there are probably other brands and other clips. These are the ones I know and they're pretty slim profile here too so I like that as well my funky yardsticks are just to keep this up like I'm quilting within about two and a half inches of this edge and if I did not hold this up the the foot of my quilting machine would bump into this white clip when I'm at this side so putting this little yardstick you can see how that just lifts this whole clip up just a little and I can adjust my yardstick depending on how much lift I want curtain rod Anything long will do that trick of just providing a little lift there. We all need a little lift. Some of us more than others. Okay, we have some questions. I'm going to get my coffee cup. Are we on the front camera? Yes. So good. Even coolish. So good. Laura, I've been trying your figure eights with tape at the bottom. I'm having a little trouble keeping them evenly spaced apart. Ideas. This actually came from a student. Try literally putting markings, even with a Sharpie, but not laying on your quilt. 
um, evenly spacing markings on that painter's tape. And then you can put the tape there and it will give you this visual. There's the dot I'm aiming for. And see if that helps with the spacing. And then you only have to do it once per quilt, right? Kathy, I have the red snappers and struggle getting it to go under the bar where my machine throat and red snapper meets. Any ideas or perhaps I'm not doing it correctly? So you might have seen me, Kathy, when I did the first advance, I had to move Stella out of the way. That is why. So the area where the rod is in my leader is the slimmest area. And where the snapper itself is on, it's much more bulky. So I was moving beyond the snapper to just the rod area. So I have clearance of that distance between my, my dead bar, my leveler bar, and my long arm itself. I have just enough clearance to feed that through, that little rod. So it's about seven millimeters. So give that a try. I might have to make an episode just about that because I have fiddled with that quite a bit to get it smoothly working. Becky, do you spend time on client tops removing frayed threads that show through or do you instruct clients to remove those before giving you the top? A little of both, Becky. If a client's got a white or light colored top, I recommend to them get those threads off and generally they are pretty good. But inevitably, just in the course of handling, there are some, so I try and be aware of them and pick them off if I can. If there's dozens and dozens and dozens and clearly they didn't make any effort to do it, I don't worry about it, quite honestly. I don't have that happen very often, but if, if they're not going to make an effort, I'm not going to go to enormous lengths unless I talk to them about it and make arrangements to do that. Make sense? Barbara, is there a certain amount of density that becomes too much when wanting a comfy quilt? Well, I don't think so, Barbara. There are more factors than just the density of the quilting to think about. One would be the type of batting you're using, which can really influence that. And also the weight of thread that you're using. And I had not thought of this myself until recently. A wonderful representative and I were talking. And she said, if you want a, a cozy quilt, but want to do quite a bit of quilting, quilt with like an 80 weight thread. And then it just keeps the quilt softer while you can still achieve that dense quilting if you want to. So you can play around with all those factors. Brenda, any suggestions on when you move your feet? I find that I tend to get stuck in one spot and find myself reaching before I move. So common. In the past, I've done a couple little reels on it, but I wouldn't know how to tell you where to find them. But basically, and I got this from a dancer, basically your weight bearing foot is the one you can't pick up and move. So that's what you're having trouble with, right? You're leaning on your foot and then that leading foot has your weight and you can't pick it up and move it. So my solution is, Never put your weight on that front foot, right? You can't see my feet. Move it forward and pull that back one along so your weight is always on your hind leg, right? And that front one is kept very light and movable. And that helps. And practice helps too. Gosh, I'm just putting myself together here. <laughs> okay, two-part question. Here we go. Michelle, do you use pre-wound bobbins? Susie, what freestanding bobbin winder do you use? Okay. Okay. Do I use pre-wound bobbins? I have used pre-wound bobbins with good success, but I do love having my top and bottom threads match or very closely match. So generally I prefer to wind my own bobbins. And Susie, if I said freestanding bobbin winder, I spoke incorrectly. I have an onboard bobbin winder. So it literally is part of my machine. It comes built into the Bernina machines. I have used freestanding ones in the past. Uh, frankly, mine came off Amazon because my Gamma one wore out and they work fine. But I do have an onboard now, and that's what I use now. Claudia, I'm new to long arming and wanted to know if you lean on your belly bar or do your best to not touch it with your body when quilting further in front of you. Um, gosh, I don't really think about it, Claudia. I feel like I don't typically lean on it. Um, I feel like I don't, but I don't think there's a reason you could not. I generally do not quilt at arm's length. I use the the great depth of my machine only when I'm trying to for some reason I need to reach something further but when I'm quilting an edge-to-edge -edge design I tend to not go to the furthest possible distance because it's more fatiguing to have to do that great big reach so I, I cut it you know a couple three inches short basically I don't advance fully hope that helps Mary Ellen, today I attempted to do hearts in the open all over method you use for crazy eights. I couldn't figure out how to create the open space. 
So were you overlapping them in rows, like, or were you just hearting everywhere? I'm not quite sure on that. But doodle it first. Figure out your thread path first is going to be my recommendation. Joan, I'm not being a smart aleck here. Why is the measuring tape on the bar at the top of the quilt? I know you don't center the quilt. If it's to make the sides equal, it's too late by the time they pass the tape. Please advise. That's a great question, Joan. Those of you who have watched me in the past know that I used to have that same measuring tape kind of attached to my rails on left and right. And I didn't use it on every single quilt, but when I did, it crossed over the quilt close to me. So sort of the front leading edge of the quilt. And now Joan is right. It's at the furthest edge. That area is already quilted. It's not as precise as it was when I laid it right over the top at the front, but it still serves to give me a guideline because I don't center my quilt. I'm not saying it's, you know, at the number 20 on this side and the number 20 on this side. I'm just taking note of where my quilt fits. So it might be the number 32 on this side and the number 19 on this. And as my quilt moves, I keep watching that 32 and 19. And sometimes I squat down and just, you know, along the edge, am I lined up with that number? Um, it, it works for me. I don't know if it's the best way, but it does work for me. I've always said I can keep my quilts within a quarter inch of square and I'm finding that still to be true. So I'm satisfied. Hope that is the answer you wanted, Joan. <laughs> Susan, when you take your machine in for servicing, does it fit in a car? Great question, Susan. Yes, it does. And I have done that and I have decided I'm not going to do that again. Here are my reasons. It's a precision machine and I don't like bundling it about like that. And at least on my Bernina, I think this is true of all machines. When you take them in to be serviced independently, they don't always get put on a frame to service. The Bernina has bolts in it and the technicians actually bolt them to a table, right? So they're fixed and do all their servicing work. That works for the machine parts. That does not make sure that everything is moving and flowing together correctly and address any issues you might have with leveling or or the height of your dead bar right anything that has to do with the frame so i've already made the determination next time i have my machine serviced i am going to pay to have someone come here and service it on site because then they get to see the big picture and i can get any questions answered that i have about machine and frame that's that's my personal opinion on that one everyone's entitled to my opinion <laughs> right Jen how long are your side clamps and if you were buying side clips again do you think you would go shorter to possibly be able to move Stella over them to change a bobbin for example multi answers to that one my side clamps are 19 inches has to do with my throat space they also come in 16 and 12s um, would I buy shorter to be able to move off to do a bobbin no on the Bernina you actually have a presser foot up down with my presser foot up I can slip right over my E edge clamps, which is one of the reasons I like them. They're so slim in profile this way. I can slip right over them to change a bobbin. It's a beautiful thing. Did I get all the question parts of that? I think I did. One more sip of coffee. Okay, you guys, one more session. What are we gonna do in this one? Do we wanna do tractor tracks again or figure eights again? I think we're going to do tractor tracks. And I think we should run them in the other direction because the tractors, you know, going back and forth in the field. Am I right? I am having so much trouble with this strap. I will never, I'm sorry, this is outfit is cute, but I will never wear it again. It's annoying me. Okay, Mr. Producer is gonna come and get the roving camera and show you to this, this process. So let's get started. We're out there in the field. see how I'm basically arranging it like a spineless feather I'm just alternating the plume if you will tread in our case left and right left and right from that spine Is it easier if I move the handlebar out of the way? Here, hang on a sec, guys. Since I have this capability on my Bernina, watch this. Now you can really see it. I 
have to go a little bit slower when I quote cool one-handed. I don't have quite as good control. I'm quite pleased with the tractor tread. It's kind of interesting. I know there are a number of quilters out there. Natalia Bonner is one. Sam Alberts is one who have YouTube channels and they always quilt one handed. And it's, it's a very good skill to have. There are times when it's really, really useful. I just find I can go quite a bit more quickly. Um, and I also think it's less fatiguing, quite honestly, to quilt with two because it's not all on one shoulder. Again, just my opinion. And of course, my style of quilting is edge to edge, so I tend to go faster than, say, Sam Alberts does. She's Quilting Curve Studio, by the way, um, but a custom quilter. And so she's maybe not looking for speed the same way that I am. So it's just an example of, of different styles. I'm not sure why I cut my thread there. Just force of habit at the end of a row. Let's do something really simple in this one again. Uh, in fact, I think we're going to do that little wavy line again. So I'm just doing a very simple wavy line kind of in the middle of this border. And I do use this one on quilts quite often. You will have a border many times that is a simple, often a dark, thin framing border. And sometimes it's a little too wide to leave unquilted, and yet you don't want something fussy in it, or maybe something wouldn't even show in it because it's dark. And this little wavy line can be really, really effective. Um, what are we going to quilt in this next one? Let's see here. What have we not quilted in a while? Let me look at my sample quilt again, you guys, just for an idea. Do, 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 do. We haven't done any swirls. Um, the circle inside a circle, I feel like this one is too big for that. Maybe we'll just do loops again. Loops has kind of been a theme on this quilt, so I'm actually okay with that. There's more loops than there is anything else. And I'm okay with that. That will kind of be the theme. So in the last set of loops I was doing, I was talking about using the stitch regulator as a way to, using the sound of it as a way to really listen to yourself quilting and really work on your smoothness of pace. So I'm not sure how well you can hear my machine over camera, but listen to this. This is what I see from a lot of quilters. When you get a long, smooth stretch, you really race, and then you sort of have to slow down for the corners. So my challenge to you is work on getting a smoother, even pace. Slow down those long, straight stretches it makes you a better quilter with better control, and it almost always results in a better stitch quality because the stitch regulator is not struggling so hard to keep up with your wild fluctuations. But it absolutely increases your control to be able to quilt more slowly and accurately or more evenly and accurately is very desirable, I think. And what better way to practice than on a small quilt like this? There's not an endless amount of quilting. Every area is small enough. You can say for this row, I'm going to focus on this thing. Smooth curves, smooth space, not touching the guardrails, whatever the case may be. And it's just a great way to hone in on some of your skills. Okay, we're gonna do the double crazy eights one more time.
here too, it can be really tempting to race on the straightways. And I encourage you to try not to. I will add to though, just as a little disclaimer, this is my third long arm machine and on some of my others, they have not had as good control when going in a diagonal line. So I did kind of have to swing my machine in order to get that pretty horizontal or er, angled line. So, you know, if you've got to do it, you've got to do it. You know your machine, but if you can focus on that evenness of pace. back through our little bitty ones. And again, I did not do any marking for this. If you're not comfortable with freestyling this, feel free to drop in either a chalk line above and below where you want these to land or blue painter's tape, which is always a great option. You can just lift and move it. You could use the same piece to be marking your various guidelines throughout this whole quilt. Make your painter's tape long enough to extend past the edges of your top and stick to the backing because it does not stick to fabric very well. The ends will curl up on you. I'm not stopping in the middle of these to lift the handlebar because I'd end up getting a wobble, sure enough. And there's our crazy eights. Okay, let's do just a simple little alternating loop on this one. I'm spacing them quite a ways apart just because I want this again to be that kind of restful line where there's not too much going on. have a fun little idea for this one. We're going to do a kind of feather and swoop. This is an example of thinking of something that's just totally out of the ordinary, just that will fill in this slim little space. Not too fancy, certainly not difficult to quilt. I keep entering my feather in the wrong direction. I don't know that you can see that because you're not close up. But you know what? It doesn't matter. I'm just crossing over my stitching down by the spine and it's okay. I did give long and serious thought to whether or not I wanted to do a somewhat contrasting thread on this quilt because it does show up these things a little bit more. But in a moment, I will dismount and I'll show you the um, farm scene on the backing and see if you agreed with me that doing the thread that matched that farm scene seemed like the good choice. You know, so many of the recipients of these baby quilts, I've given a few away in recent years and um, they're often not quilters. They're, you know, young couples, what have you. And so it doesn't occur to them that the front plain side with the, with the fun quilting is the front they often think the printed bit is the front. So I wanted to be sure that that printed bit looked really good. And I thought it would look better with the olive green thread than with the red. And I'm going to advance just a touch because it's very close to my front rail. I probably can do it without moving my clamps at all. I'm just gonna advance like an inch just to move a little bit away from that front rail. And I'm gonna do one last, I think, I think we'll do swirls, just the C swirl. Here again, I want to be very sure 
that I don't um, quilt all the way down to my basted edge because that's where my binding is going to go on and I don't want to cut off what I've quilted. So I'm actually staying about a quarter inch away from it. I don't care if there's a tiny little bit of space below the um, below the C shapes, but I don't want to cut them off with my binding. So I'm playing it safe. What kind of animal makes these tracks, do you think? Farm animal. I can't think of one. Once again, I did not mark these, but I was kind of heads up looking um, the last three or four of them to try and space them so that I had one at the end and not half a one at the end. And look at that. It worked like I planned it that way. So that is the end of our quilt. I'm going to take all my side apparatus off um, and unload this front edge so that you can see the front. So be typing in your last bits of questions or comments. I'd love to hear what you think of the thread choice. Oh, do we want to do one more roving camera, Mr. Producer, with a close up of some of these? And I was going to show the tire tracks. They saw the tire. That's right. You were showing the tire tracks as I was quilting. Okay, great. As always, I do post pictures. It sometimes takes me a day or two till I get some good lighting in the studio to really show up the quilting. Um, so if you're on social media, I'll have pictures on Facebook and Instagram for sure. And I will update the thumbnail on YouTube. So there's a bit of a better one there too. Okay, let us loosen up the top just a little. And we'll pull this bottom off. This is why I love the red snappers. Look at this. Two seconds and it's off. Love them, love them, love them. But I wanted you to be able to see the back of my little quilt. What's the best way to show it? Can you show it over like that? There I can. See if you can see it. See the little barns? There's horses and sheep. I can do anything. I can fully lift it off is what I can do. It will only take a jiffy. And then you guys can see the front of it. Yep. Since I bragged about how fast these are. So while I'm doing this, if you've enjoyed this show, please, please like and subscribe. Hit the little bell to receive future notifications. Even share with your quilty friends. And there we go. And of course, you can't see the quilting really at all on this side. But you can see the little, the little farm panorama. Super cute. There's the quilting. I'll move it a little so you can see it against the light. Isn't that pretty? So honestly, it's really simple. And how long did that take? Like if I wasn't talking in on camera, you know, I don't know. And your quilting's not the same pace as mine. But I'm going to say two hours, two and a half hours plus binding two pieces of fabric, you've got a quilt. It's awesome. Here's my little leader that's on the edge. Remember I said I had to add, I inadvertently trimmed my backing instead of trimming my top to be narrower. So the whole quilt got narrower and I just put extensions on that backing so I could keep it as large as possible. So now I'll trim that off and the quilt itself is about three eighths of an inch in from that. It'll all be good. I'll bind it, it's good to go. So there we are, front camera, great. Cuppa in hand, lean back from the quilt. Okay, any questions or thoughts? Okay, one more time, I wanted to talk to you about the show that's coming up next week. So next Friday is the 28th of July and it's my birthday and I'm turning 29 again. And um, yeah, with about a lot of years experience, let's just say. Um, so several of my freehand quilting masterclass students, and I don't even know who they all are, have arranged an on-air birthday party for me. So here's what I know. Um, our daughter Allison and my sister Mary are going to be co-hosting and I'll be there and it's going to be aired live and that's really about all I know. So I welcome you to the birthday party next Friday. It'll be um, 9 a.m. Pacific time, the same time that these live and unscripted are. So I invite you to join us and we shall see what we shall see. Um, what else? Be sure to check out the description below 
after we have uploaded this, which will happen in the next hour or two, um, there will be a long description that has some of my favorite tools and links to them. Some of them we've mentioned throughout the comments, but I know that can be difficult to come back and find. So the long tape measure, uh, lots of things are there, some of my favorite tools that I use. So that's an easy way to find those. If you want information on my free hand quilting masterclass, the next um, group of students will be joining in late September and early October. So there's information on that on my website, stitchedbysusan.com. If you want to read about it, there's some details there about all that's included. But it is generally freehand quilting. And for the most part, it's edge to edge quilting, like quilting the same thing over the entire surface quilt. There's a little over 30 different designs that I present in there and teach in depth. Um, it's just my way of walking you through building a portfolio from easy to more difficult, uh, different styles, feminine, you know, less feminine, outdoorsy, geometric, so that you have this range of things that you can quilt. So information on that on my website. I mentioned very briefly my monthly membership and it's called Advance. It is not necessarily advanced beyond the freehand quilting masterclass. You could do it independently. One is not a prerequisite for the other. But Advance has broader things in it. So custom quilting, case studies about individual quilts that I've done and the processes and decisions that came into it. Um, guest presenters, Sam Alberts, who I mentioned earlier, is one. So she's a custom quilter and she thought, she talked through how she, um, how she thinks up plans her designs and marks them coming up in August is Carly Porter if you know Carly Porter she's going to be the guest presenter in August so that's just a few days away lots of different things in there but basically it's a it's a membership for machine quilters who want to advance their skills try new things and get an inside look at what my studio and other quilter studios look like so information on that on my website too so I think that's all about that Thanks again to Mr. Producer. He did a great job today. Do any of you have any questions before we go that we can address? Michelle, do you ever post a snapshot of the quilting patterns that you've done after the videos? I'd love a picture or is it available online for purchase? Oh, I go one better than that, Michelle. If you look me up on Pinterest, I'm stitched by Susan there. I have lots and lots of boards, but particularly look for my gallery custom and my gallery edge to edge. So those pictures all are my quilting. So if you look at my gallery edge to edge, for example, that is a lot of the designs that are in the freehand quilting masterclass. And you'll see the same designs often repeated, but on different quilts. So you can get this visual of what it looks like on quilts. That's the easiest place to look at photos and mass. Sue, that outfit is cute. I think the problem would be solved if you just move the straps where they are attached at the back over a bit toward the center. Ah, I see what you're saying, Sue. That might be a good solution. And I know how to do those things. Once upon a time, I was a garment sewer. So, Susan Lee, question. I missed it. Did you put a different color thread front versus back? Getting ready to quilt a white background with navy floral that I'm trying to decide if I want a navy floral back. I, for this project... I put the same olive green top and bottom. Now, olive green, it's a deep olive green and red are similar in hues, so I perhaps could have gotten away with red on one and green on the other. But in the case of navy and white, I would not put white thread and navy thread. Absolutely, I would not do those extremes. So either pick white or navy or pick your backing that you're happy with the white thread, for example. High contrast threads are a bugger to make pretty stitches. White and red, black and red, navy, or sorry, white and black, white and navy, white and red. Those are very hard to get pretty stitching. So I prefer to match my threads much more closely top and bottom. Barbara, the C's reminded me a bit of horses hoof marks when they have horseshoes on. Great one, Barbara. I briefly thought of like, I wonder if I could do cloven hoofs. And I probably could have, but I didn't. But you guys might on your own farming quilt. Nancy, definitely doing a few of those great practices. What fabric are you going to bind with? Thanks again for sharing. Um, good question, Nancy, because I think it would be appropriate probably to get more of the solid color red, and I did just recently purchase it, so I think I can. I may also look through my stash and see if perhaps I would have a stripe that would look good with both the farm scene and the red, like maybe a tiny, tiny little black and white stripe. So something like that. 
And Barbara, how did you determine the height of your long arm? It looks like you don't stand as straight as you could. Great question, Barbara. I do think I messed around with my height and experimented a little bit. I think that my long arm is taller than most people's. Um, I think my hunching is kind of my own fault. That I don't have great posture. So I'm working on that. And thanks for prodding me because I'll work harder at it. Um, I can see it just fine. I just tend to want to get closer to it. So I don't think I could do my long arm a lot higher and not have my arms start to get tired from having to lift. So it's definitely higher than my elbows. You can't really see it, can you? Um, but it feels comfortable for me. Here's the elbow. Can you see? My elbow is below that. Like it's hitting me rib cage. And I like that. I like it to be a little bit higher than typical. And your question is, is it high enough? So that's my answer. Wendy, loaded with helpful tips. Thanks. I'm becoming more fluent in quilt. Quilt speak. There we go. I um, love that. Savannah, can you show an up-close shot of the print side so we can see the thread? Ah, so I will make it a point to take some good pictures of the close-up on the print side for social media. Mr. Producer, which are we going to do? Okay, Mr. Producer is going to bring that trusty roving camera again, so let me get the quilt held up. I'll hold it. extra money if I'm on air way too much today. <laughs> he says he needs extra money because he's on air way too much today. I'll try and hold it still, but I'm holding it toward the light so that it will hopefully show. Can you see it at all? It's upside down. Oh, it's upside down. For goodness sakes. The cows are standing on their heads, the poor things. So it is there, but because it's in the olive green, it's quite subtle. But frankly, that's what I wanted. You know, I didn't... That's why I chose not to use the red thread. I thought that red thread, if it's across the sky and the green grass and everything, is going to look so red on the back. And if the recipient chooses to treat this as the top of the quilt, I didn't think that was a great look. I much preferred the, the subtle but still pretty contrast of the green thread on the solid red. That was my choice, and I'm sticking to it. So hope you have found this very, very helpful. Again, if you enjoyed it, oopses and all, like and subscribe, bring your quilty friends. So we will be airing again next Friday, July 28th. It will not be a project, however, it's going to be the birthday party. I'm the birthday girl turning 29 for about the 150th time. Um, so you're welcome to join the party. You know, bring your own cake and ice cream is all I ask. And uh, with that said, I will see you in August, probably the first or second week of August and Friday, we'll be back with another project. Sign up for my newsletter and I'll let you know what that project is a couple days beforehand. So thanks so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure quilting with you today, as always. See you next time.